So today I think we're, we're interested in, in talking a little bit about the, the face of um, telecom and uh, transport and how we think it's going to evolve in the near future and particularly maybe looking at some of the switching aspects of it around the um, reconfiguration of the network and how the network uh, itself is going to evolve and you know what the role of each of our different companies is uh, in, in providing for that future. So, um, well good, that's our favourite subject. So. That's right. Thank you. Good to be here. So, uh, where should we start on this? Uh, probably um, on the reconfigurable piece, right? That's what. Uh, hopefully, they'll finally be reconfigurable after we're done with this. You know, we've been. We probably needed a new name after OADM, so we called it reconfigurable optical add drop multiplexer. But they weren't all that reconfigurable. You know, we uh, we had to use a lot of manual labor in order to move it from, say, a different color or a different channel or a different direction. So we're we're really looking to finally getting to. Uh, to fully reconfigurable optical add drop multiplexers. Maybe we need another term for it, I don't know. I, I agree, totally agree. I think reconfigurable um, failed um, to realize um, if they were fixed um, mainly or um, only tunability was with tunable lasers. So one could basically take advantage of sparing transponders with a single part, but uh, it was not possible to move signal on any wavelength in any direction. Um, Plus, these uh, reconfigurable OEDMs had issues with uh, wavelength contention and blocking. So I would agree. And I, if I could make a proposal, I would call them something, something like a photonic uh, routers or processors, because now going forward, uh, they do much more. So wavelength selective switches uh, are uh, ideal devices uh, for, for these new networks, because they do more than just switching wavelengths. Um, we use them today to do you know, power preemphasis, to do uh, in-band signaling, uh, they can do optical channel, pow optical power measurements, um, some diagnostics, a uh, lot of other things which we were not able to do before and we needed separate devices, separate cards to do those functionalities. Today we can do um, with a single component, which is quite exciting, makes these rodents much smaller. Yeah, it really is an enabler that we didn't have before. You know, uh, the, the part we do today, if we have to move a different direction or a different channel, we have to send a technician out there. He's got to first off get the right one off of a piece of paper. Then he's got to pull it out. He's got to clean the connector, hopefully, and put it into the proper direction and the proper channel. And even if he gets that right on one end, he's got to get it right on both ends of that network in order to make it work. And, and what we're looking for in the future is having a, a common place to plug them. That's where the contentionless also comes in at. If we can put a switch between there, then all of the transmitter receivers get plugged into the same location, they all get cabled the same way, and then we can make those changes remotely. And we can even drive it with a control plane. You know, before, the control plane was really debatable here because what value did it really give you if you don't have a switching mechanism at both the, not only the intermediate locations, but also the access and egress. And that's what we're really, really looking forward to in next generation products. So you mentioned, again, transparent networks and, and the level of transparency that we can achieve now is, is actually increasing in terms of having transparency, not only of the optical path, but of the bandwidths in the optical path that we can have and so forth. Uh, this, this is something I think has been a really interesting push and pull. There's been a pull from the carriers and there's also been a bit of a push from us as network, as component providers saying, hey, here's some capabilities that we have now that we've gone to wavelength selective switches. Um, the interesting thing there is a wavelength selective switch intrinsically just disperses the light and then switches the light in two separate operations. So there's always a possibility that you can then divide that spectrum up however you want to divide that spectrum up. And so some of the advances that we've had recently in the component space is being able to say, hey, we can divide this spectrum up almost arbitrarily. You know, we'll decide a protocol how we divide it up, but really it's just a protocol we can really allocate that spectrum in any way we want. Now, those types of advances, I guess, have been carried at the same time with a bit of a pull from the industry, which is saying, hey, we're looking at next generation transport, and we really think there's a need for that. I mean, well, right. Yeah. Right, where it comes into play is that, you know, current networks, 50 gigahertz channel spacing has been fixed, not necessarily because of the WSS, but say because of the AWG, if nothing else, that was front ending and at the access and egress port. We're saying if we remove that, and now we've got the capability to do colorless directionless, 
if we want to do gridless or, or a flexible grid type of structure so that we can go to 400 gig or 600 gig or a terabit or whatever we decide the next bit rate's going to be, we can migrate to that over time. And if we want to do super channels and eventually we have single carrier, we can change that grid over time as opposed to fixed grids that we've had today. I agree. We cannot predict the future, no one can, so, but we know that the bandwidth is growing and uh, what we can do is provide the infrastructure which is prepared and ready to handle growth of traffic. Not only, I would say, not only in terms of bandwidth, but also like uh, where will you have your ad drop? Um, now you have all these NFL cities and you have your big rodents there. Um, but it's important to um, make rodents inexpensive enough so they can be placed in a smaller location and when, where you can start with a two degree node and grow this up to a degree should it ever be required. It, it is because you know the, the CO of the future looks a whole lot more like a data center and those data centers may not be in traditional locations uh, that we've had central offices in because it, it isn't such a direct tie to the end user customer. So there is going to be a significant need for Rotom type functionality in areas where we didn't necessarily see it before and I think that having that flexible grid type of structure also gives us an improvement in spectral efficiency. You know, there's been one argument, well, we don't know if it's going to be 200G or 400 or 600 or a terabit or what that next bit rate may be, but we can get an, an advance from it, we get an, a benefit from it, even if we stick at 100G, and that's from simply eliminating some of those dead zones that we have today, the, the spacing between the channels that we can't use. We can take advantage of that now by moving those channels closer together, even if it stays at 100 gig for a period of time, we can still take advantage of that. And traditionally, as you got closer to the edge of the network with the lower cost rodents, I guess they've been on a different grid spacing to the, the core of the network, which has really been the 50 gig focused, whereas at the edge of the network, maybe there's been a lot more 100 gig type networks. I think now we can see that you know, if, if the spectrum is, is flexible, it should be flexible right through the network and that, that flexibility then allows you to, to mesh up the network in, in I guess, more, uh, um, more transparent fashion. Absolutely. Um, I would say that um, more work needs to be done in to, uh, than providing flexible spectrum allocation in wavelength selective switches. Some work has to be done on standardization because we will need tunable lasers for these new frequency grids and uh, I'm looking forward to work with. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's one thing we've, we've made contribution actually, uh, joint contributions. And, and what we're trying to say is the, flex, the, the ITU grid has served us well over the last uh, 20 years or so, 15 years. It served us well, so we don't want to abandon it, but what we do want to add is more granularity. Even over and above, even if the bit rate stays at 100 gig for an entire generation of equipment, we'll be able to get better spectral efficiency and use it more efficiently by having the flexible grid architecture built day one. Uh, by, because you can't go back and add that. I mean, that's the, the one thing that we do have an opportunity here, and the next opportunity could be a long time to introduce it because it's the kind of thing, it's at the heart of the product, so you can't yeah, just it cannot replace be it in later. Service. There's no in-service There's service no in-service upgrade. upgrade, right, yeah, right. It has to be, be put a in. a forklift upgrade, and no, no one wants that. Right. So what's, what's the life cycle you see in the Rotom equipment that you're deploying, and you know, how much do you have to think about deploying for the future, and how much can you just say, well, this is the network? that we're going to deploy today. That's one thing that makes it a lot different than traditional switches. You know, we usually think about switches as in Ethernet or routers, and, and a lot of times those were built around a two, three, four, five year time frame, where transport equipment is pretty much a decade long decision. You know, by the time you put in the first one, by the time you start another generation of equipment, it can be 10 years um, before you get to play that, play that game again or get to, get to play new technology. So well, you really got to look quite a ways out. And, and that's how we ended up with traditional systems, conventional systems today that went from, were optimized at 10G, they were upgraded to 40, and a lot of them are now going to accept 100G channels. Uh, that's a significant step. I think we're fooling ourselves if we want to optimize the next system for 100G and allow it to last for 10 years. It's probably going to have to go to higher data rates, and it's certainly want to do better spectral efficiency, so we'd like better spectral efficiency out of it uh, over that decade of, of time, from the, when you put in the first one to when you put in the last one of, say, that generation of equipment. Now, there's also a lot of changes. I know High T7500 is a great example where it's evolved over time as well, over that decade that it's probably been used. That's correct. Um, we, we, we see it the same way. We have deployed some infrastructure already in 2003, 2004, and these systems are now being upgraded to 40G and some of them to 100G. So um, we had not planned this day one, uh, that we never envisioned that we would have. 
within five, six years, 100G upgrades on these platforms, but it happened. So going forward uh, with 100G, it's conceivable that we will need 200G, 400G, or whatever that next format might be. Um, and we see also that 25 gigahertz spacing is probably sufficient granularity. Um, one thing we haven't ma mentioned so far, but now talking to uh, wavelength selective switch uh, supplier, such as Finisar, um, there's certainly need for a larger devices. So today we are commercially deploying one by nine. Uh, we would be very happy to have a device such as one by 20 plus, one by 23, with the same functionality within the same or smaller footprint. And I would dare to say that uh, there is also room for something like two by 46, uh, packaging more of these devices, uh, at least two, in, in a single package uh, where we can take great advantage and build some new novel architectures for uh, contentionless, for example. Yeah, I couldn't and, agree more. And and I, Steve, that's yours. Yeah, I, I certainly <laughs> see that's a, a trend that people are starting to look at in the industry now. And um, you know, one of the reasons why that's really useful is it allows the, the switch to be used not only for the core transport, but it also can be used for the first stage of the demaxing or the first stage of the maxing. And a single switch then can be used for both functions. And so now there's some new architectures that are being explored. I think some of the architectures involve having WSS both at the ingress and the egress of a rotom. And th these are quite interesting architectures. They put some more constraints on the design of the WSS in that um, instead of going through a single filtering element for each rotom, you're now going through two filtering elements for each rotom. But an architecture like that then demands of the WSS supplier of us that we start looking at how can we make our spectra sharper um, to make sure that if you go through more of these rotoms, you don't distort, you don't get bigger dead zones between your, um, between your uh, bands of interest. And so that's the next big challenge for us. And it's one we're responding to. We've got um, product plans now, both addressing the larger port count and also product plans addressing um, how, how we can keep a, a much sharper spectrum. Uh, higher resolution is the way we like to think of it. Yeah, they come in useful not only in, because many times you don't have that many degrees that you can use, but you use them for other things. Overlays, express routes. In a metro environment, we've even used them to attach large customers. If you take a very large customer and you, you attach them directly with a degree, now they're part of your network as opposed to an extension of your network, which means you know at least one more one fewer back-to-back -back transponder inside the central office and much more flexibility to reprovision them to go different directions, say in a protection or restoration environment. It is, the, 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 the great thing here is that there's a whole lot of new technology becoming available and we have the opportunity to use it because a lot of folks are, are capping out their current networks. You know, where they started with 80 wavelengths and, and a lot of those are filling up, there's an opportunity to overbuild. And you want to overbuild it with the current generation products, you want to build it with brand new products, and, and obviously we'd like to take advantage of any new technology that's out there. And fortunately, there's a whole lot becoming available that we just didn't, weren't able to choose from last time. So we're really looking forward to that. Yeah, this is a very exciting time for us too. We, we are building new generation Rodem, and uh, as Glenn said before, we are looking uh, for 10 year minimum lifespan to make them upgradable from you know, starting now 40G coherent, 100G coherent, 96 channels and then take it to whatever next uh, format might be. So, Glenn Jelko, thank you very much for your time today in discussing this. It's always really interesting for us as component vendors to see where our product goes and how it's used. And um, uh, I'd like to thank you for taking place in this today and also for your contribution to the industry and, and, and the work we've done together. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Nice to see you. It's my pleasure.